Anesthesia, Wikipedia article audio In the practice of medicine, anesthesia, or anesthesia is a state of temporary induced loss of sensation or awareness. It may include analgesia, paralysis, amnesia, or unconsciousness. A patient under the effects of anesthetic drugs is referred to as being anesthetized. Anesthesia enables the painless performance of medical procedures that would cause severe or intolerable pain to an unanesthetized patient. Three broad categories of anesthesia exist. Medical Uses Techniques In preparing for a medical procedure, the healthcare provider giving anesthesia chooses and determines the doses of one or more drugs to achieve the types and degree of anesthesia characteristics appropriate for the type of procedure and the particular patient. The types of drugs used include general anesthetics, hypnotics, sedatives, neuromuscular blocking drugs, narcotic, and analgesics. There are both major and minor risks of anesthesia. Examples of major risks include death, heart attack, and pulmonary embolism whereas minor risks can include postoperative nausea and vomiting and hospital readmission. The likelihood of a complication occurring is proportional to the relative risk of a variety of factors related to the patient's health. The complexity of the surgery being performed and the type of anesthetic used. Of these factors, the person's health prior to surgery has the greatest bearing on the probability of a complication occurring. Patients typically wake within minutes of an anesthetic being terminated and regain their senses within hours. One exception is a condition called long term postoperative cognitive dysfunction characterized by persistent confusion lasting weeks or months, which is more common in those undergoing cardiac surgery and in the elderly. The purpose of anesthesia can be distilled down to three basic goals or end points, 236. Different types of anesthesia affect the end points differently. Regional anesthesia, for instance, affects analgesia, benzodiazepine type sedatives favor amnesia, and general anesthetics can affect all of the endpoints. The goal of anesthesia is to achieve the endpoints required for the given surgical procedure with the least risk to the patient. To achieve the goals of anesthesia, drugs act on different but interconnected parts of the nervous system. Hypnosis, for instance, is generated through actions on the nuclei in the brain and is similar to the activation of sleep. The effect is to make people less aware and less reactive to noxious stimuli. 245. General Anesthesia Loss of memory is created by action of drugs on multiple regions of the brain. Memories are created as either declarative or non-declarative memories in several stages the strength of which is determined by the strength of connections between neurons termed synaptic plasticity. 246 Each anesthetic produces amnesia through unique effects on memory formation at variable doses. Inhalational anesthetics will reliably produce amnesia through general suppression of the nuclei at doses below those required for loss of consciousness. Drugs like midazolam produce amnesia through different pathways by blocking the formation of long-term memories. 249. Tied closely to the concepts of amnesia and hypnosis is the concept of consciousness. Consciousness is the higher-order process that synthesizes information. For instance, the sun conjures up feelings, memories, and a sensation of warmth rather than a description of a round, orange warm ball seen in the sky for part of a two-four-hour cycle. Likewise, a person can have dreams during anesthetic or have consciousness of the procedure despite having no indication of it under anesthetic. 
It is estimated that 22% of people dream during general anesthesia and one or two cases per 1,000 have some consciousness termed awareness during general anesthesia. 253. Equipment Anesthesia is unique, in that it is not a direct means of treatment, rather it allows others to do things that may treat, diagnose, or cure an ailment which would otherwise be painful or complicated. The best anesthetic, therefore is the one with the lowest risk to the patient that still achieves the endpoints required to complete the procedure. The first stage of an anesthetic is the preoperative risk assessment made up of the medical history, physical examination, and lab tests. Diagnosing a person's preoperative physical status allows the clinician to minimize anesthetic risks. A well-completed medical history will arrive at the correct diagnosis 56% of the time which increases to 73% with a physical examination. Lab tests help in diagnosis but only in 3% of cases, underscoring the need for a full history and physical examination prior to anesthetics. Incorrect preoperative assessments or preparations are the root cause of 11% of all adverse anesthetic events, 1003. One part of the risk assessment is based on the patient's health. The American Society of Anesthesiologists have developed a six-tier scale which stratifies the preoperative physical state of the patient called the ASA physical status. The scale assesses a high order of risk as the patient's general health relates to an anesthetic. The more detailed preoperative medical history aims to discover genetic disorders, habits, physical attributes and any coexisting diseases that might impact the anesthetic. The physical examination helps quantify the impact of anything found in the medical history in addition to lab tests, 1003-1009. Monitoring Aside from the generalities of the patient's health assessment, an evaluation of the specific factors as they relate to the surgery also need to be considered for anesthesia. For instance, anesthesia during childbirth must consider not only the mother but the baby. Cancers and tumors that occupy the lungs or throat create special challenges to general anesthesia. After determining the health of the person undergoing anesthetic and the endpoints that are required to complete the procedure, the type of anesthetic can be selected. Choice of surgical method and anesthetic technique aims to reduce risk of complications, shorten time needed for recovery and minimize the surgical stress response. Sedation Anesthesia is the combination of the endpoints which are reached by drugs acting on different but overlapping sites in the central nervous system. General anesthesia has three main goals, lack of movement, unconsciousness, and blunting of the stress response. In the early days of anesthesia, anesthetics could reliably achieve the first two, allowing surgeons to perform necessary procedures but many patients died because the extremes of blood pressure and pulse caused by the surgical insult were ultimately harmful. Eventually, the need for blunting of the surgical stress response was identified by Harvey Cushing, who injected local anesthetic prior to hernia repairs. 30 This led to the development of other drugs that could blunt the response leading to lower surgical mortality rates. Regional Anesthesia The most common approach to reach the endpoints of general anesthesia is through the use of inhaled general anesthetics. Each has its own potency which is correlated to its solubility in oil. This relationship exists because the drugs bind directly to cavities in proteins of the central nervous system, although several theories of general anesthetic action have been described. Inhalational anesthetics are thought to exact their effects on different parts of the central nervous system. For instance, 
the immobilizing effect of inhaled anesthetics results from an effect on the spinal cord whereas sedation, hypnosis, and amnesia involve sites in the brain. 515 The potency of an inhalational anesthetic is quantified by its minimum alveolar concentration or MAC. The MAC is the percentage dose of anesthetic that will prevent a response to painful stimulus in 50% of subjects. The higher the MAC, generally, the less potent the anesthetic. The ideal anesthetic drug would provide hypnosis, amnesia, analgesia, and muscle relaxation without undesirable changes in blood pressure, pulse or breathing. In the 1930s, physicians started to augment inhaled general anesthetics with intravenous general anesthetics. The drugs used in combination offered a better risk profile to the person under anesthesia and a quicker recovery. A combination of drugs was later shown to result in lower odds of dying in the first seven days after anesthetic. For instance, propofol might be used to start the anesthetic, fentanyl used to blunt the stress response, midazolam given to ensure amnesia and sevoflurane during the procedure to maintain the effects. More recently, several intravenous drugs have been developed which, if desired, allow inhaled general anesthetics to be avoided completely. 720. Nerve Blocks The core instrument in an inhalational anesthetic delivery system is an anesthetic machine. It has vaporizers, ventilators, an anesthetic breathing circuit, waste gas scavenging system and pressure gauges. The purpose of the anesthetic machine is to provide anesthetic gas at a constant pressure, oxygen for breathing and to remove carbon dioxide or other waste anesthetic gases. Since inhalational anesthetics are flammable, various checklists have been developed to confirm that the machine is ready for use, that the safety features are active and the electrical hazards are removed. Intravenous anesthetic is delivered either by bolus doses or an infusion pump. There are also many smaller instruments used in airway management and monitoring the patient. The common thread to modern machinery in this field is the use of fail-safe systems that decrease the odds of catastrophic misuse of the machine. Patients under general anesthesia must undergo continuous physiological monitoring to ensure safety. In the U.S., the American Society of Anesthesiologists have established minimum monitoring guidelines for patients receiving general anesthesia, regional anesthesia, or sedation. This includes electrocardiography, heart rate, blood pressure, inspired and expired gases, oxygen saturation of the blood, and temperature. In the UK the Association of Anesthetists have set minimum monitoring guidelines for general and regional anesthesia. For minor surgery, this generally includes monitoring of heart rate, oxygen saturation, blood pressure, and inspired and expired concentrations for oxygen, carbon dioxide, and inhalational anesthetic agents. For more invasive surgery, Monitoring may also include temperature, urine output, blood pressure, central venous pressure, pulmonary artery pressure and pulmonary artery occlusion pressure, cardiac output, cerebral activity, and neuromuscular function. In addition, the operating room environment must be monitored for ambient temperature and humidity as well as for accumulation of exhaled inhalational anesthetic agents, which might be deleterious to the health of operating room personnel. Sedation creates hypnotic, sedative, anxiolytic, amnesic, anticonvulsant, and centrally produced muscle relaxing properties. From the perspective of the person giving the sedation, the patient will appear sleepy, relaxed and forgetful, allowing unpleasant procedures to be more easily completed. 
Sedatives such as benzodiazepines are usually given with pain relievers because they don't, by themselves, provide significant pain relief. From the perspective of the person receiving sedative, the effect is a feeling of general relaxation, amnesia, and time passing quickly. Many drugs can produce a sedative effect including benzodiazepines, propofol, thiopental, ketamine, and inhaled general anesthetics. The advantage of sedation over a general anesthetic is that it generally does not require support of the airway or breathing and can have less of an effect on the cardiovascular system which may add to a greater margin of safety in some patients. 736. When pain is blocked from a part of the body using local anesthetics, it is generally referred to as regional anesthesia. There are many types of regional anesthesia either by injecting into the tissue itself, a vein that feeds the area or around a nerve trunk that supplies sensation to the area. The latter are called nerve blocks and are divided into peripheral or central nerve blocks. Spinal, Epidural, and Caudal Anesthesia The following are the types of regional anesthesia, 926-931 Acute Pain Management When local anesthetic is injected around a larger diameter nerve that transmits sensation from an entire region it is referred to as a nerve block or regional nerve blockade. Nerve blocks are commonly used in dentistry when the mandibular nerve is blocked for procedures on the lower teeth. With larger diameter nerves the nerve and position of the needle is localized with ultrasound or electrical stimulation. The use of ultrasound may reduce complication rates and improve quality, performance time, and time to onset of blocks. Because of the large amount of local anesthetic required to affect the nerve, the maximum dose of local anesthetic has to be considered. Nerve blocks are also used as a continuous infusion, following major surgery such as knee, hip, and shoulder replacement surgery, and may be associated with lower complications. Nerve blocks are also associated with a lower risk of neurologic complications compared to the more central epidural or spinal neuraxial blocks. 1639-1641 General anesthesia suppresses central nervous system activity and results in unconsciousness and total lack of sensation. Sedation suppresses the central nervous system to a lesser degree, inhibiting both anxiety and creation of long-term memories without resulting in unconsciousness. Regional anesthesia and local anesthesia which block transmission of nerve impulses between a targeted part of the body and the central nervous system, causing loss of sensation in the targeted body part. A patient under regional or local anesthesia remains conscious, unless general anesthesia or sedation is administered at the same time. Two broad classes exist. Peripheral blockade inhibits sensory perception in an isolated part of the body such as numbing a tooth for dental work or administering a nerve block to inhibit sensation in an entire limb, central, or neuraxial, blockade administers the anesthetic in the region of the central nervous system itself, suppressing incoming sensation from outside the area of the block. Examples include epidural anesthesia and spinal anesthesia. Central neuraxial anesthesia is the injection of local anesthetic around the spinal cord to provide analgesia in the abdomen, pelvis, or lower extremities. It is divided into either spinal, epidural, and caudal. Spinal and epidural are the most commonly used forms of central neuraxial blockade. Spinal anesthesia is a one-shot injection that provides rapid onset and profound sensory anesthesia with lower doses of anesthetic, and is usually associated with neuromuscular blockade. 
Epidural anesthesia uses larger doses of anesthetic infused through an indwelling catheter which allows the anesthetic to be augmented should the effects begin to dissipate. Epidural anesthesia does not typically affect muscle control. Hypnosis, analgesia, muscle relaxation Because central neuraxial blockade causes arterial and vasodilation, a drop in blood pressure is common. This drop is largely dictated by the venous side of the circulatory system which holds 75% of the circulating blood volume. The physiologic effects are much greater when the block is placed above the fifth thoracic vertebra. An ineffective block is most often due to inadequate anxiolysis or sedation rather than a failure of the block itself. 1611 Risks and Complications Recovery History Society and Culture Pain that is well managed during and immediately after surgery improves the health of patients and the potential for chronic pain. Nociception is not hardwired into the body. Instead, it is a dynamic process wherein persistent painful stimuli can sensitize the system and either make pain management difficult or promote the development of chronic pain. For this reason, Preemptive acute pain management may reduce both acute and chronic pain and is tailored to the surgery, the environment in which it is given and the individual patient, 2757. Infiltrative anesthesia, a small amount of local anesthetic is injected in a small area to stop any sensation. The effect is almost immediate, peripheral nerve block. Local anesthetic is injected near a nerve that provides sensation to particular portion of the body. There is significant variation in the speed of onset and duration of anesthesia depending on the potency of the drug. Intravenous regional anesthesia, dilute local anesthetic is infused to a limb through a vein with a tourniquet placed to prevent the drug from diffusing out of the limb. Central nerve blockade. Local anesthetic is injected or infused in or around a portion of the central nervous system. Topical anesthesia, local anesthetics that are specially formulated to diffuse through the mucous membranes or skin to give a thin layer of analgesia to an area. Tumescent anesthesia, a large amount of very dilute local anesthetics are injected into the subcutaneous tissues during liposuction. Systemic local anesthetics. Local anesthetics are given systemically to relieve neuropathic pain. Pain management is classified into either preemptive or on demand. On demand pain medications typically include either opioid or nonsteroidal anti inflammatory drugs but can also make use of novel approaches such as inhaled nitrous oxide or ketamine. On-demand drugs can be administered by a clinician or by the patient using patient-controlled analgesia. PCA has been shown to provide slightly better pain control and increased patient satisfaction when compared with conventional methods. Common preemptive approaches include epidural neuraxial blockade or nerve blocks. One review which looked at pain control after abdominal aortic surgery found that epidural blockade provides better pain relief in the period up to three postoperative days. It reduces the duration of postoperative tracheal intubation by roughly half. The occurrence of prolonged postoperative mechanical ventilation and myocardial infarction is also reduced by epidural analgesia. Risks and complications as they relate to anesthesia are classified as either morbidity or mortality. Attempting to quantify how anesthesia contributes to morbidity and mortality can be difficult because a person's health prior to surgery and the complexity of the surgical procedure can also contribute to the risks. Prior to the introduction of anesthesia in the early 19th century, the physiologic stress from surgery caused significant complications and many deaths from shock. 
the faster the surgery was, the lower the rate of complications. The advent of anesthesia allowed more complicated and life-saving surgery to be completed, decreased the physiologic stress of the surgery, but added an element of risk. It was two years after the introduction of ether anesthetics that the first death directly related to the use of anesthesia was reported. Morbidity can be major or minor. There is usually overlap in the contributing factors that lead to morbidity and mortality between the health of the patient, the surgery being performed and the anesthetic. To understand the relative risk of each contributing factor, consider that the rate of deaths totally attributed to the patient's health is 1 colon 870. Compare that to the rate of deaths totally attributed to surgical factors or anesthesia alone illustrating that the single greatest factor in anesthetic mortality is the health of the patient. These statistics can also be compared to the first such study on mortality in anesthesia from 1954, which reported a rate of death from all causes at 1 colon 75 and a rate attributed to anesthesia alone at 1 colon 2680, 993 direct comparisons between mortality statistics cannot reliably be made over time and across countries because of differences in the stratification of risk factors, however, there is evidence that anesthetics have made a significant improvement in safety but to what degree is uncertain. Rather than stating a flat rate of morbidity or mortality, Many factors are reported as contributing to the relative risk of the procedure and anesthetic combined. For instance, an operation on a person who is between the ages of 60-79 years old places the patient at 2.32 times greater risk than someone less than 60 years old. Having an ASA score of 3, 4, or 5 places the person at 10.65 times greater risk than someone with an ASA score of 1 or 2. Other variables include age greater than 80, gender, urgency of the procedure, experience of the person completing the procedure and the type of anesthetic, 984 obstetrical, the very young and the very old are all at greater risk of complications so extra precautions may need to be taken. 969-986 On December 14, 2016 the Food and Drug Administration issued a public safety communication warning that repeated or lengthy use of general anesthetic and sedation drugs during surgeries or procedures in children younger than three years or in pregnant women during their third trimester may affect the development of children's brains. The warning was criticized by the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, which pointed out the absence of direct evidence regarding use in pregnant women and the possibility that this warning could inappropriately dissuade providers from providing medically indicated care during pregnancy. Patient advocates noted that a randomized clinical trial would be unethical, that the mechanism of injury is well established in animals and that studies had shown exposure to multiple uses of anesthetic significantly increased the risk of developing learning disabilities in young children, with a hazard ratio of 2.12. Special Populations The immediate time after anesthesia is called emergence. Emergence from general anesthesia or sedation requires careful monitoring because there is still a risk of complication. Nausea and vomiting are reported at 9.8% but will vary with the type of anesthetic and procedure. There is a need for airway support in 6.8%, there can be urinary retention and hypotension in 2.7%. Hypothermia Shivering and confusion are also common in the immediate post-operative period because of the lack of muscle movement during the procedure, 2707. Post-operative cognitive dysfunction is a disturbance in cognition after surgery. 
it may also be variably used to describe emergence delirium and early cognitive dysfunction. Although the three entities are separate, the presence of delirium postoperatively predicts the presence of early POCD. There does not appear to be an association between delirium or early POCD and long term POCD. According to a recent study conducted at the David Jeffen School of Medicine at UCLA, the brain navigates its way through a series of activity clusters, or hubs on its way back to consciousness. Dr. Andrew Hudson, an assistant professor in anesthesiology states, recovery from anesthesia is not simply the result of the anesthetic wearing off but also of the brain finding its way back through a maze of possible activity states to those that allow conscious experience. Put simply, the brain reboots itself. Long-term postoperative cognitive dysfunction is a subtle deterioration in cognitive function, that can last for weeks, months, or longer. Most commonly, Relatives of the person report a lack of attention, memory, and loss of interest in activities previously dear to the person. In a similar way, people in the workforce may report an inability to complete tasks at the same speed they could previously. There is good evidence that POCD occurs after cardiac surgery and the major reason for its occurrence is the formation of microemboli. POCD also appears to occur in non-cardiac surgery. Its causes in non-cardiac surgery are less clear but older age is a risk factor for its occurrence, 2805-2816. The first attempts at general anesthesia were probably herbal remedies administered in prehistory. Alcohol is one of the oldest known sedatives and it was used in ancient Mesopotamia thousands of years ago. The Sumerians are said to have cultivated and harvested the opium poppy in Lower Mesopotamia as early as 3400 BC. The ancient Egyptians had some surgical instruments, as well as crude analgesics and sedatives, including possibly an extract prepared from the mandrake fruit. Bian Kei was a legendary Chinese internist and surgeon who reportedly used general anesthesia for surgical procedures. Throughout Europe, Asia, and the Americas a variety of selenum species containing potent tropan alkaloids were used for anesthesia. In 13th century Italy, Theodoric Borgognoni used similar mixtures along with opiates to induce unconsciousness and treatment with the combined alkaloids proved a mainstay of anesthesia until the 19th century. Local anesthetics were used in Inca civilization where shamans chewed coca leaves and performed operations on the skull while spitting into the wounds they had inflicted to anesthetize. Cocaine was later isolated and became the first effective local anesthetic. It was first used in 1859 by Carl Kohler, at the suggestion of Sigmund Freud, in eye surgery in 1884. German surgeon August Beer was the first to use cocaine for intrathecal anesthesia in 1898. Romanian surgeon Nicolae Racovacianupitesti was the first to use opioids for intrathecal analgesia he presented his experience in Paris in 1901. Early Arab writings mention anesthesia by inhalation. This idea was the basis of the soporific sponge, introduced by the Salerno School of Medicine in the late 12th century and by Hugo Borgognoni in the 13th century. The sponge was promoted and described by Hugo's son and fellow surgeon, Theodoric Borgognoni. In this anesthetic method, a sponge was soaked in a dissolved solution of opium, mandragora, hemlock juice, and other substances. The sponge was then dried and stored, just before surgery the sponge was moistened and then held under the patient's nose. When all went well, the fumes rendered the patient unconscious. The most famous anesthetic, 
ether, may have been synthesized as early as the 8th century, but it took many centuries for its anesthetic importance to be appreciated, even though the 16th century physician and polymath Paracelsus noted that chickens made to breathe it not only fell asleep but also felt no pain. By the early 19th century, ether was being used by humans, but only as a recreational drug. Meanwhile, in 1772, English scientist Joseph Priestley discovered the gas nitrous oxide. Initially, people thought this gas to be lethal, even in small doses, like some other nitrogen oxides. However, in 1799, British chemist and inventor Humphrey Davy decided to find out by experimenting on himself. To his astonishment he found that nitrous oxide made him laugh, so he nicknamed it laughing gas. In 1800 Davy wrote about the potential anesthetic properties of nitrous oxide in relieving pain during surgery, but nobody at that time pursued the matter any further. American physician Crawford W. Long noticed that his friends felt no pain when they injured themselves while staggering around under the influence of diethyl ether. He immediately thought of its potential in surgery. Conveniently, a participant in one of those ether frolics, a student named James Venable, had two small tumors he wanted excised. But fearing the pain of surgery, Venable kept putting the operation off. Hence, Long suggested that he have his operation while under the influence of ether. Venable agreed, and on March 30, 1842 he underwent a painless operation. However, Long did not announce his discovery until 1849. Horace Wells conducted the first public demonstration of the inhalational anesthetic at the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston in 1845. However, the nitrous oxide was improperly administered and the patient cried out in pain. On October 16, 1846, Boston dentist William Thomas Green Morton gave a successful demonstration using diethyl ether to medical students at the same venue. Morton, who was unaware of Long's previous work, was invited to the Massachusetts General Hospital to demonstrate his new technique for painless surgery. After Morton had induced anesthesia, surgeon John Collins Warren removed a tumor from the neck of Edward Gilbert Abbott. This occurred in the surgical amphitheater now called the Ether Dome. The previously skeptical Warren was impressed and stated, Gentlemen, this is no humbug. In a letter to Morton shortly thereafter, physician and writer Oliver Wendell Holmes, Sr. proposed naming the state-produced anesthesia, and the procedure an anesthetic. Morton at first attempted to hide the actual nature of his anesthetic substance, referring to it as lethean. He received a U.S. patent for his substance, but news of the successful anesthetic spread quickly by late 1846. Respected surgeons in Europe including Liston, Diefenbach, Pirogov, and Syme quickly undertook numerous operations with ether. An American-born physician, but, encouraged London dentist James Robinson to perform a dental procedure on a Miss Lonsdale. This was the first case of an operator anesthetist. On the same day, December 19, 1846, in Dumfries Royal Infirmary, Scotland, a Dr. Scott used ether for a surgical procedure. The first use of anesthesia in the Southern Hemisphere took place in Lanceston, Tasmania, that same year. Drawbacks with ether such as excessive vomiting and its explosive flammability led to its replacement in England with chloroform. Discovered in 1831 by an American physician Samuel Guthrie, 
and independently a few months later by Frenchman Eugene Sobeyeren and Justice von Liebig in Germany, chloroform was named and chemically characterized in 1834 by Jean-Baptiste Dumas. In 1842, Dr. Robert Mortimer Glover in London discovered the anesthetic qualities of chloroform on laboratory animals. In 1847, Scottish obstetrician James Y. Simpson was the first to demonstrate the anesthetic properties of chloroform on humans and helped to popularize the drug for use in medicine. Its use spread quickly and gained royal approval in 1853 when Jon Snow gave it to Queen Victoria during the birth of Prince Leopold. During the birth itself, chloroform met all the Queen's expectations, she stated it was delightful beyond measure. Unfortunately, though free of ether's flammability and consequent explosion hazard, Chloroform is not as safe pharmacologically, especially when administered by an untrained practitioner. This led to many deaths from the use of chloroform that might have been preventable. The first fatality directly attributed to chloroform anesthesia was recorded on January 28, 1848 after the death of Hannah Greener. John Snow of London published articles from May 1848 onwards on narcotism by the inhalation of vapours in the London Medical Gazette. Snow also involved himself in the production of equipment needed for the administration of inhalational anaesthetics, the forerunner of today's anaesthesia machines. The first comprehensive medical textbook on the subject, Anesthesia, was authored in 1914 by anesthesiologist Drive James Taylor Gwathmi and the chemist Dr. Charles Baskerville. This book served as the standard reference for the specialty for decades and included details on the history of anesthesia as well as the physiology and techniques of inhalation, rectal, intravenous, and spinal anesthesia. Of these first famous anesthetics, only nitrous oxide is still widely used today, with chloroform and ether having been replaced by safer but sometimes more expensive general anesthetics, and cocaine by more effective local anesthetics with less abuse potential. Almost all healthcare providers use anesthesia to some degree, however most health professions have their own field of specialists in the field including medicine, nursing and dentistry. Doctors specializing in perioperative care, development of an anesthetic plan, and the administration of anesthetics are known in the US as anesthesiologists and in the UK, Canada, Australia, and NZ as anesthetists or anesthesiologists. All anesthetics in the UK, Australia, New Zealand, Hong Kong, and Japan are administered by doctors. Nurse anesthetists also administer anesthesia in 109 nations. In the U.S., 35% of anesthetics are provided by physicians in solo practice, about 55% are provided by anesthesia care teams with anesthesiologists medically directing anesthesiologist assistants or certified registered nurse anesthetists and about 10% are provided by CRNAs in solo practice. There can also be anesthesiologist assistants or physician assistant who assist with anesthesia. There are many circumstances when anesthesia needs to be altered for special circumstances due to the procedure, the patient or special circumstances. <laughs>